that's a perfect arena for you because you want change. I swear that thing changes every single day. Right now I might host some live workshops, but then I can sell them as a replay after. I don't have to like commit to hosting it once a quarter, right? It is so much change that I don't have anything that grounds me in the confidence of what I need to do to go forward. That was a really, really important learning lesson was like, it's okay to get bored and just plan for it instead of pretending to be surprised every time. Hey, so today I have Mallory Rowan on the podcast as a guest. Our interview is so much fun. She used to be a power lifter, started a business with her boyfriend where they're still partners today, eight and a half years later, and learned things from that business to parlay into her next business. She's into Instagram and then also real estate investing. And we just talk about things, trends and not burning out and becoming your best self and allowing room for things to change. Maybe you thought it would look like this and then allowing it to show up like something else. So listen in and learn lots. Today, friends, we have Mallory Rowan as our guest of honor. She comes to us from Canada. So hi, Mallory. Hi, I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming. Okay, so you have one of these incredible stories of a person that just became successful because you put all the time and work and stayed consistent on things at a very young age. And not only did you do it in one arena, you did it in multiple arenas. So bring us back to younger Mallory before the success hits and who you are as a person. Ooh, okay. Um, well, I grew up in competitive dance, so I feel like being like organized was just like a necessity early on, and that was definitely part of it. Um, but it also meant I was like really passionate in general and like very full on with things, right? Because dance, competitive dance, you don't really do it lightly. Like it's, it's pretty full on, right? So um, I did that growing up, and always you know, was into like marketing and organizing things. In high school, I planned my prom. I did a lot of the like charity fundraisers that we did, things like that. And it was always kind of a part of my life was this like interest in business, marketing, um, and just putting things together. But I didn't really know how to pinpoint that. I just thought it was like things I enjoyed doing. Okay. And so you enjoyed all these pieces and then went to school Yeah. Where'd you go? And like, what'd you study in school and how'd that look? Yeah. So I studied uh, journalism at Carleton and then I did a minor in business. So when I was studying journalism, I always knew like I was into business. So I picked up a job working corporate marketing, um, really enjoyed the marketing side of things. So then took on the minor in business and journalism was really cool because you got to play a lot. Like, even though it was like what we'd call here university is like college for you guys and our college is like community college. So for us, like university was very like theory for most programs. There's a lot of exams, whereas the journalism program was very hands-on. Like you didn't have exams. You were like writing articles for a real newspaper. You were producing TV segments. So I got to be so hands-on with a lot of the skills that I still use today as like a the content creation. But I went to school for that. I was enjoying the business stuff as well. And then kind of worked my whole way through university and office jobs. I was really early to getting into more of the corporate world because I knew that I liked that stuff more than like a job at the mall. And so that was a really great experience. And then I kind of moved through like super corporate to more startup world to like even smaller startup and then really started my own thing after that. Okay. And what made you decide, okay, I'm starting my own thing. Like what was the triggering point there? So it was actually a class project, which was really cool. Like our school was so encouraging around entrepreneurship. And the year before we had done a group project where, you know, we had to make up this product, do all these pitches around it. And we made like a toothbrush that had like floss in it. And it was something I was like not very passionate about. So the next year I knew I wanted to do something I was actually interested in. And the teachers were really encouraging too of like, Hey, if you have a business or if you have a business idea you want to pursue, like do that. Like, even if you want to have a co-founder, that's not in the class. So me and my training partner, like my powerlifting training partner at the time, um, we decided to do this business together. And that was really kind of what started it. We knew that powerlifting was at a time where there wasn't really like a brand that represented the modern day power lifter. And so that's something that we really wanted to make. And we were students. So we had all these like big ideas, but we were like, we do not have budget for most of these ideas. So like we can start with something achievable, like a lifestyle brand. And that's really what kicked it off for us. Okay. So uh, tell me about powerlifting. Now I'm all curious. I don't even know what's powerlifting these days. (laughs) Yeah. So powerlifting is like squat, 
uh, bench press and deadlift. Those are like the three main lifts and you can compete in it as a sport, like go all the way up to worlds even. Um, and it's a really great community. It's a lot of former athletes too, because you kind of start going to the gym after maybe you had a sport and then you're naturally squatting, right? You're naturally doing the bench press and usually deadlifting as well. So it's a really easy sport to get into, but it was super fun. And when we got into it, there was kind of this shift of like before people pictured like bald, big bellied, tattooed guys as powerlifters. And it was really moving to this. Like there was a lot of university students, a lot more women, a lot of people with like similar values, super minimalist. And that's really what we tried to bring together with our brand. Okay. And so then what was your first brand? And is it still in business today? So we have it closed for now. We kind of have it on a back burner of it might come back one day, but it was a powerlifting lifestyle apparel brand and we helped athletes give back. So like every item we sold, um, in general, we were providing one month of clean water to somewhere that needed it. And then sometimes we would collaborate with pro athletes and then they would pick a charity of their choice that was like significant to them in some way to help give back. Um, and it, it was really great. It was a really good time. I think we were just young and hadn't fully thought through, like, do we want to make t-shirts forever? So we almost sold it. And then we're like, you know what? This brand is like so special to us that it was really hard to put that price tag on it. And I'm like, I think it will have a resurgence one day. So it's kind of like in our back pocket. And I think it will come back. I love it. You're allowed to have a passion project and you're allowed to like say, Hey, here's what it's going to do for us right now. And we are emotionally invested. So I don't need to sell it, but I also don't need to be doing it all the time. If right now doesn't make sense. And for you to have that ability to say, Hey, right now this doesn't make sense and just put it on the back burner. That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. And it was a like everything that we learned in that helped propel our next businesses like so much faster too, right? Because you learn the things that worked, the things that you maybe didn't love and how you can build from the start with those things in mind. Yeah. 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 So what would be one of the key takeaways from the first business? Uh, for me, definitely. Like I know that I get bored with things and I think I was at a point of like trying to find that thing that I won't get bored of eventually. And so, you know, a lot of business goes hand in hand with personal development, obviously, but I realized like, that's just kind of how I am. I like the change. So that was a really big lesson for me of how do you build that into the business, right? So even right now I might host some live workshops, but then I can sell them as a replay after I don't have to like commit to hosting it once a quarter. Right. Um, or a lot of the courses that I'm making are things that can exist on their own and someone can do self-led because I knew that eventually I might not want to be teaching those things live or one-on-one again. So that was a really, really important learning lesson was like, it's okay to get bored and just plan for it instead of pretending to be surprised every time. Oh, look at that nugget. That's a good one. I like it. So is that how you got into content creation with like Instagram was your next business or did you have another business before? we get to the third? Yeah. So we used Instagram to grow that first business, especially since we didn't have a budget. Like we went to events and we grew through the fitness Instagram community. So that was really how that first business developed. And at the same time, I was sharing my powerlifting journey. So I kind of started a community just through that naturally. And then it shifted to sharing behind the scenes of my business. And then because marketing and business really has always been my first love, it's something that comes so naturally to me, but I know so many people have these incredible talents and then don't know how to get it in front of people because the business and marketing side is what really overwhelms them. So that's where I kind of shifted to talking more about that and helping people understand how to get their business out in front of people in a way that felt really good. So that's kind of how I transitioned into that, um, which is what I do now is teaching online. And then at the same time, my partner went into real estate. So my training partner that I started the first business with, we started dating at the same time, which is probably not a great idea, but it worked out. We're still together like eight and a half years later. Uh, That worked out. That was a great idea. You're not like, no, obviously eight and a half years later, that is success, my friend. Awesome. I'm like, I don't know if I would give it as general advice, right? But it works for us. Like we started the business and started dating at the same time. It's all we've ever known. And it, it works really well for us. And so he went into real estate And we also use Instagram to grow that business. So as I was teaching it, I was also like applying it with his business. And so that was really fun. And now that's kind of turned into a real estate team that we have together. Oh, I love it. That's amazing. Yeah, no, Instagram, 
I mean, you obviously that's a perfect arena for you because you want change. I swear that thing changes every single day, right? You're like, and I finally was like, okay, listen, I'm hiring a company to help with that piece because it is so much change that I don't have anything that grounds me in the confidence of what I need to do to go forward. So how do you help people feel confident in what they're posting on Instagram. I think the biggest thing is like, it's, there's so much advice out there now, which can be really great, but then also we hear it and we think we need to apply everything, right? I think we really have this fear of like getting left behind. So like reels would be one, right? Like reels come out, everyone's like, you have to do these short form videos. Everyone started like dancing and pointing at, even though like it felt really unnatural to them. And so I think for me, it's really about like, okay, can we get the base lesson of whatever this advice is and then find a way to apply it to ourselves, right? So I have some students, like they mostly show up through stories and that feels really good for them. They get great clients through it and their feed is still kind of like, their kids playing hockey, but it works for them. Right. But if they spend all that energy of like putting on this pressure of like their feed needs to look a certain way, they probably just wouldn't show up at all. So I think finding like the easiest way for you to show up, still pushing yourself out of the comfort zone, but that's really what I like to help people with is like, Hey, you actually don't have to post like seven times a day. You don't have to be on that 24 seven and you don't have to do anything that feels disingenuous to yourself. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot because there are so many trends or so many different things. And you're like, oh my goodness, what happens if I don't do this? What happens if I don't do that? And I finally got to a point where it was, okay, this is who I am. And I might fall out of favor sometimes and I might be in favor sometimes, but I need this to be fun because if I'm not doing something fun, then it becomes work and then I don't like it anymore. And I really feel all of us just have to be stay true to who we are what excites us and just allow that to shine through. A hundred percent. Like you have a story to tell and the new features will come out and you can choose how you use those. But I think that's where like, ultimately, if you're putting out what you want to put out, people will feel that more than they'll feel you like forcing a trend. Like this year, you know, Instagram was really pushing these short trending audios. And I just started doing like minute long voiceover videos that were my own thing. And like, those were exploding, right? So even though all of the advice was saying like, short form trends, I was doing entirely the opposite thing, but it was working because people felt so connected to it because it was so much like genuine thought went into it. Now, how far in advance do you plan out your content as a person that does this for a living? I honestly only plan like a week or two at a time. Um, I just find like if I go too far past that, I'm not excited about the ideas anymore by the time I get there. Or honestly, ever since I would say the pandemic too, I find our world just changes so fast that like even something that felt really inspiring to post two weeks ago maybe feels like borderline tone deaf now, you know, like it really depends on what's happening in the environment. Um, and so I really try to read the room a lot. And for myself, I just have realized that's how I put the best content forward as much as it's part of my business content for me has always been like a form of expression. And so if I get too like systematic with it, I lose that side of it. And I like to just show up and play a little bit. Oh, I like that. Now, do you feel your journalism background because you get the story arc, you get the concept of keeping people entertained. Does Has that played like a huge role in your success? Yeah, I would say so. Like I remember there was a phase where they were talking about marketing teams were hiring journalists because when everything's going to web, it's like journalists have always known how to get the most important thing out, right? Like we always talk about the hook and like journalists have been writing that the lead, right? The first paragraph of an article and like the headline, which is what's going to make people click for so long that I think that structure and thought process is already naturally there. The storytelling is there. And even things like audio editing, editing the videos, like I still use the platforms that I used in journalism school. So definitely it, it was a really great um, degree for that. Oh, that's amazing. How often do, can any of us say like what I used in college, I can still use today. I mean, I hate to say that, but most of us go to college and we get into real life and it's what? What did we have to do those four years for? Like, none of this is applicable to what I'm doing right now. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, it's so great. And that's why I really praise the program too, that it was so hands-on. And like, I think with having that element too, our teachers weren't 
professors doing their PhDs. Like our teachers were people who produced the evening news. Like they were still very much working in the field. And so I think that was really cool to actually be so hands-on in a program. Cause you're right. I think of my business minor and I'm like, I don't really use much from that, even though I'm in business. Right, 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 right. So when people come to you, what do you feel is the people's biggest fear about Instagram or socials in general? I think people are just scared of like, being perceived as something they're not. I think we see a lot on the internet that we don't like, and then we become so scared of being that person, right? The overly salesy person, or maybe the cringy person. And so we let a lot of those fears hold us back. And then the other biggest one I would see is like, um, either already burnt out or afraid of burning out. Those are really big ones of just like seeing it as a never ending commitment. And I do talk a lot about burnout because I burned out after my first business. Um, And so people have a lot of the time that hesitation, especially with women. I get a lot of women that are like um, thinking about having a kid. And so it's like that trigger point where they're like, I need to change because I know I can't like take care of another human and keep operating the way that I am. And then like add social media to my business. Mm -hmm. So what, how do you help them with that? Like, what's the advice that you give to people to keep them from burning out? Uh, I think a lot of it is like, focusing on the activities that are going to be the most effective. You know, we say like 20% of results usually or 80% of results usually come from like 20% of your effort. So really figuring out like, what are the things that work well for you? I think trading like frequency for consistency. So people think consistency means like you have to show up every day on every platform, but it's really about creating a consistent experience for your community, right? So your consistent experience could be that you post once a week, right? It could be that you post twice a month and it's really good. And maybe you show up on stories in between, right? So I think like adjusting those expectations that we don't even realize we're putting on. Like, instead of just thinking about getting on Instagram, people are usually straight to like, well, shouldn't I post five days a week? I'm like, well, let's post once a week for two months and get into that rhythm. And then we can do two and maybe we'll land on three, you know, but we think we have to do this zero to a hundred jump. And now people who are doing personal brands on Instagram or different, like, how are you recommending they balance the material that they're posting because you don't want to, I mean, I agree. There's a lot of salesy people that every single thing you look at, you're like, I'm unfollowing you at this point. I don't want any more sales down my throat. So how do you recommend people balance those pieces out? Yeah. I always say like, if, if you're scared of being that person, you will probably never be that person, right? Because those people aren't scared of that. Like they're just sharks and they're hungry and they're cool with it. And I think if that is a hesitation for you, it's like just knowing you're never going to get to that point is the first thing. Um, I also think you can choose how much you share about like what you're going through. Um, There can be a line between like getting personal and getting private, right? So I could be really personal and vulnerable. And let's say I don't right now, but let's say I have three kids, like you might never know that about me. Right. And so I think that's a hesitation people have around personal brands is like, everything's out on the table, but there's a way I can be really vulnerable and maybe share my career story with people in a way they can connect with. And no one has to know that I have children or they don't need to even know where I live, like what city, you know, there's such variety in how much you share. And I think sometimes people get so worried about how to show up that they get scared of putting out the personal, but Definitely building those personal connections, telling stories of your own experiences that people can relate to, sharing educational content, really thinking of your content as like law of attraction of if you put out good things that represent your brand, people will come. And that's just remembering once in a while, like you have to say like, hey, I have an offer. I have a product if you'd like to work with me, because sometimes people go so far that they forget to like ever put it out there. I call it like a where's Waldo of your offer of like people love everything you're doing, but they're like looking in the book. Like I can't even find Waldo in this photo. Like I can't find where, or how to work with this person. I love that. That's a great visual for all of us to keep in mind. Like, okay, we don't want it in their face, but we also don't want it so hard that they're not able to sign up and work with us if we need it, if they want to. So your third business is the real estate business. Yes. And that you kind of do with your husband a little bit. Is it fun? Like if a realtor is listening to this, What advice do you have for them with using social media? Oh, like, 
use it, period. Like I would say 95% of our leads come from social media and they are way more qualified than most other leads. They're way more coachable because there's already been like a relationship building there. There's trust there, right? If you're showing up and you're using your face, you're using your voice. When people meet you, it's just confirmation that you are that person that already feels familiar. Whereas if you're just posting like sold photos of houses, they don't have that connection. So when people come to us, they're more educated on the process because they've learned from our content. They are, like I said, more coachable because there's trust there. So if, if they find the perfect house and Josh says, you know, this is what we have to do with the offer. I know it's a little intimidating, but like this will get it for you. There's so much more trust there that they're like, okay, let's do it. So they often are actually converting faster too. Like he's had several clients like reach out on a Sunday, they go for showings on Tuesday. And by Wednesday, they have an offer accepted because they're just like, all right, Josh, let's do it. Like we trust you, you know? Oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. That's the power of social media being used in its best form. Yes. So how do you, okay. So how do you balance your life with all that you have going on so that you don't just become this like social media star and don't develop other parts of yourself. Yeah. (laughs) I think having boundaries around it for sure. Like, um, even for myself, like I don't scroll that much. So like, even though it might look like I'm on social 24 seven, cause I'll like upload stories or post frequently for me, like a boundary is I just can't get lost in the scroll because then I'm literally never off of a screen. Right. Because I'm working on a laptop and posting So like for me, I have less scroll time. And then I think really finding your non-negotiables. Like I really stopped working in the evenings and weekends unless I there was something I like really want to tackle. Like last night it was raining. It was a vibe. I had some creative work I wanted to do. So I decided to do that, but I won't set meetings or anything like that in the evening or the weekends. Um, And then just finding those places like we were talking about earlier you and I before of like those happy places of like, even now I'm at my cottage and today we just decided to come up for the day, work from here because that extra hour I have, I can spend it on a paddle board. Right. And that's really going to bring me back and reset me. And that's, what's really going to be important. Yeah, no, I love that. Now with this new thing out, right. Instagram threads or the threads thing. That's how mature. That's how much I know about it right now. What do you feel about all these new channels coming out and should be people jumping on them? Should they like wait? Like, all that stuff. I think it always depends on like energy and alignment. So like, do you have the energy to jump on it? Because if you're feeling really tapped, then I'm like, don't bother. You can, you can miss the opportunity, you know, whereas I've had, um, some students that are like, you know what threads actually feels really exciting to me. I've been posting more on threads in this week than I have on Instagram in like months because they've put a lot of pressure maybe on their Instagram. So I think if it feels really aligned and it feels like, Oh, like words, this is my thing. You know, I can do short form. I can write these things really well, then lean into it. There's obviously always going to be benefits to being an early adopter of a platform. Like we see it with every platform, right? YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, like the early ones tend to be the biggest accounts, um, at least at the beginning, but It really depends. Like if you do not have the energy, then just put on headphones, tune it out, pretend it never happened for now. If it feels really exciting to you, run with it. Oh, I like that. That's helpful because I'm looking at it and I keep hearing the noise and it's noise to me right now, just because I'm, I, I like to, there's a certain level of quality that I like to do things. And I don't think I can maintain that quality without taking quality out of other parts of my life. And so I have to give myself permission to just say, this is sitting on the sideline and when it's time, it's time. Yeah, totally. And, and you can find an in-between too. Like I got on threads. I'm not going like crazy hard. There's no strategy. I'm just picking up my phone and posting some thoughts here and there. And for me, it almost feels nice. I have like zero expectations, you know, like if a post gets three likes, I'm like, cool. Right. Whereas maybe if you were on another platform, you'd be like a little more stressed if your content wasn't getting engagement. So For me, it's a bit of a throwaway right now of like, let's see what happens here. The one cool thing I'll say about threads is with the Instagram connection is it's probably like the fastest platform right now to build audience because when you join threads, it asks, do you want to follow everyone that you follow on Instagram? So a lot of accounts, like I think I saw like Kim Kardashian has like 3 million plus followers on threads already, but it's because of this carryover, right? So a lot of creators are starting on there with an audience, which is kind of cool, but ultimately that just means you're like 
connected with the same people you're already connected with, right? So I wouldn't stress about getting on it. Right. And are you on the different platforms? Are you recommending that you post different things just to keep it spicy and people want to follow you on the different platforms? Do you find that people really just commit to this platform and if that's where they find you, that's where they find you. I think it depends for sure on your audience. Like I think um, we all know like who our ideal customer is and they usually have a platform that they primarily use. And then I think it's like looking at the nuance between the platforms. And again, like if you have capacity for that nuance. So as an example would be like, I started posting on YouTube with YouTube shorts, which is like their short form content. I am just posting like reels because that stuff is already made. So I'm just taking content that exists and I'm plopping it off, scheduling it. And I'll, I'll take a look after and see, you know, what performs well. And then it will be a question of, do I want to create any content specifically for shorts? But for now, it's just a place where I'm repurposing and like TikTok's kind of the same. It's like at the minimum you can repurpose. And then if you want to have more of a strategy on that platform, you are usually going to have to tweak a little bit of what you're sharing. Ah, oh, there's so many things. There's so many things. So what do you see your future being? Like now that you have this business up and running and you like new, are you, do you have something else biting at you? Honestly, this year, like I just turned 30 and I feel like it's very much a less is more. Like um, we were supposed to be like Airbnb in this place. And the more we're up here, the more I'm like, maybe just that first, like my main business could make more to support giving myself this instead of turning it into a business. And that's kind of what I'm leaning into now is a little bit of less. Um, But I'm really excited about learning right now. Like I'm always trying to learn more about money, investing, those kind of things, because I think that really does open up opportunities. And then I love not being dependent on my work because I think that's where I can become the most creative is just like what feels really good to share, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how, I mean, we talked a little bit earlier and I'm jumping back to this subject, but you're doing some live training and what you've learned is, okay, I'm going to do this live training. I might get bored with this material. And so I'm going to record it and then repurpose it into potential classes that people can do at a self-paced rate. What softwares and things are you using for that? And how are you, I mean, that's a little bit of work itself. It's not just, hey, do this and we're done. Yeah. So like, I'm a big fan of starting simple, simple, right? Like you can do it with just a checkout page. Like I use something like Thrivecart um, that just does a checkout page, or you could use like a lot of websites, like a Squarespace or like would have... um, like a payment option as well. So you don't even need a separate checkout, but you can host those on Zoom, record it. Sometimes when I upload, I even just upload like a workshop to a Dropbox and send people that link as the replay. But I use Teachable as my main course platform. So I have some courses that I have like pre-recorded and they're all separate videos with worksheets, downloads, and those are in a teachable platform. And then sometimes when I do the one-off workshops, yeah, I'm just putting it in a Dropbox and sending people the link. And you'd be surprised how much people don't need the flashiness sometimes too, right? It's just like they know how Dropbox works or they know how Google Drive works. Great. They can watch it. They can come back to it. Um, And then just using an email provider, like I use ConvertKit, but Flowdesk is really good if people are just getting started. It's like a more modern day MailChimp, I would say. But yeah, you can create like a landing page for people to sign up even through something like Flowdesk, collect email, send them the replay all through that. Oh, wow. You've mastered all these things. What has surprised you the most about um, what you've gotten into? I think like for me, I think just like how much going with the flow works and can be a strategy because I think like, you know, when when you work for yourself, there's all this like forecasting and business plans and like you should know what um your sales are going to be in Q4 or what those activities are going to be and for me it was just realizing that like going with the flow actually can be a strategy and that for me it works really well it does still stress me out a bit <laughs> and that's where it's like it's a a lot of personal development and learning it's like the more i go with the flow the more it works out so i have to constantly remind myself cuz it's kind of like i was talking about with content if i get too far with planning it tends to backfire with me and i don't put the most like excitable product for myself out there whereas if i'm like you know what i have this really great workshop idea and i want to host it next month we're doing it and then i find that will 
every time get me better success than if I was like, okay, next February, I'm going to host this workshop on this because by the time it comes around, um, it might not be like the opportunity that's aligned anymore. Yeah. It's fascinating how much that can change for us. Right. I mean, I'm hosting a retreat in September that's sold out right away, which I'm super excited about, but then there's people that want to be a part of it. And so I'm trying to decide, do I really want to do it again in October and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be burnt or it's going to be that ship sailed. So now I need a different energy. And it's just, it's funny when we allow ourselves to plan, but then not getting too far ahead, where now all of a sudden it becomes an obligation instead of an opportunity. It's a fine line. It is. And like you said, especially when it's your first one, it's like you want to give yourself that space to be like, how did I like this? Right. How did it feel? And I, I find like people are so open in marketing too. Like, I think we always think we have to have like this big plan as if we're big companies, but for something like that, like I honestly will tell my audience, like, I don't know how I'm going to like this. So September's the one. And like, if it's full, here's a wait list. Maybe I'll host one next year. Maybe I'll host one the next month. We're not sure yet. Let's see how this goes. You know? Yes. That authenticity, allowing yourself to just be, Hey, I don't have the answers and it's okay. And I'm going to do what feels right. Because if I do what feels right, then I know whatever comes out of it is going to be right for you as the other side of the table. Exactly. Oh, I love this. No, it's just been fun to hear everybody's story of how they they go from one thing to the next and where it starts and why it stops. And it, we all have our stories and we all have these things that like pull us into a million directions. So before you get burnt out, because I know you help a lot of people with this, what are some of the things and triggers that you notice in your life? That's like, Oh, this is a sign that I need to start dialing back or it's going to get ugly. Yeah. I think like when I look back at the earliest signs that I missed, it was definitely like more of the emotional and mental side of things, um, versus physical. Like there's a quote that says like, if we don't listen to our body, when it whispers, it will make us listen when it screams. And so I think that's very true for burnout. We often like only see burnout once the physical signs start, but a lot of those early signs can be things like you know, feeling not like your usual self, like kind of losing some personality, maybe feeling like a little bit dulled down from what you normally are. I know for me, I was just like, oh, like I just feel like I'm like a 50 year old man. Like I'm so tired at like 22 or whatever I was where I was just like, oh God, this is like what it's going to be. And I just thought that's like how I was. And I found I was like really irritated easily. I was like, you know, the wrong song came on the radio and you're like crying, but you're like, Oh, it's just a sad song. But it's like, there's just like so many signs where, you know, you're feeling that dimmed personality. You're not feeling like yourself. And those are like the early signs that I think with, um, the mental side of things, we think about pushing through and that's really a sign of strength. But I think really what ends up happening is like, we're just pushing it down and then it comes out through our body. Right. So, I mean, shingles is a, like a diagnosed example of that, right? Where shingles is often stress related, but I think there's a lot of other things like gut issues, skin issues. Um, People will have trouble sleeping. They might have like aches and pains. So there's so much that can translate to your body. For me, I was getting really bad rashes on my face. I was like losing my hair. I got pneumonia, but those things all come like so far after, but we're just pushing through because it's like the tough commendable thing to do. We're rewriting that narrative. It is not the commendable thing to do, to self-sacrifice to a point where your body is yelling as loud as it can. I got into a car accident in 2018 that totally shifted my life. And I say that that accident saved my life because it needed to be an event that was that loud for me to wake up because I was so on autopilot and it's one of those things that you just become the boiling frog of your circumstances and you don't even know where to dial back because everything has so much momentum in the wrong direction. And so that car accident was like an abrupt line of you slow down or you're done. And it gave me this permission to say, okay, I'm here. I have a purpose. I actually hold the pen to my story and I get to write it and direct it and author it and all the pieces. So is this really what I want it to look like? And I realized there were some changes that needed to take place so that I could live my best self and giving myself permission. It's not my, it's not my default mode. Like I still have to slow down at the end of the week and put little triggers in saying, okay, was this week what I would want next week to look like? If not, what needs to change? Because 
I don't want that momentum to build again in the wrong direction. Yeah. And I think what's really hard to like accept around this is a lot of people think this idea of like slowing down or like maybe you're like readjusting your goals and you're not um, going to like achieve as much. And I think it's so interesting that when we like take off the goal of just like overachieving and like these massive, whether it's like revenue goals or fitness goals, that when you actually start being more in alignment and like listening to your body, you often will get to the same place or further just in a much healthier state. And I think that's what a lot of people aren't fully getting. And it's hard to like reassure people of that, but they think, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, sacrifice some of the goals to like take care of myself. And maybe in the short term, it will feel that way. But in the long term, like I am way better off in my business taking care of myself and having reasonable work days than I was when I was overworking, even if we looked from a revenue perspective. Right, 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 right. I mean, I can imagine. So today you're up at the cottage and you're going to go paddle boarding for an hour. That's where you slow down enough that your ideas can catch up to you. And all of a sudden these creative things come out of nowhere. I like I tease because I swear to God, my best ideas are when I'm in the shower. Okay. Like how, like, why is the shower the place that births these ideas, right? Do they come out of the shower head? It's just hilarious, but it's, it's because, oh, I'm slow enough for my ideas to actually be heard in my head versus me always doing external output. I can actually receive. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know the full science of this, but I know that our brain has like different states and that our brain is like in a different state in places like the shower. And that's part of why those ideas come. And I also think like, we don't realize how much we're on our devices. And so when you're in the shower, like you actually have 10 to 20 minutes where you're not checking your email, you're not picking up the phone, you're not seeing a text. So it's like, no wonder, we, you know, we have these spaces where the ideas come out on the paddleboard or when you're laying down at night, it's like, yeah, cause you finally put your phone away, you know? Yeah. 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 Definitely. I love how you're approaching your goal of saying, okay, we have this cottage. We actually really like it. I don't know if I want to rent it and turn it into something where I'm swapping sheets every other week that a guest comes. And so what can I do in this other area of life that will allow this area of life to balance me out as a whole? And I think that's a testament to having multiple income streams, which I'm sure you recommend to a lot of your people. I mean, anybody who has a product, they don't have one, they have multiple products and how they, how they can all balance each other out. Um, so I like that, that you're doing that. I'm like that you're being creative and allowing the space for it to show up. And while you're planning for it, you're not holding on to it so tight that it doesn't have flexibility to show up a different way. And I think a lot of us can get very rigid. So how do you stay like rigid yet flexible, which would sounds like you've mastered pretty well. Yeah. I would say it's really like, Honestly, a lot of it is checking in often of like, what is this end goal or vision that we think we have for something? And then constantly asking like, is that still aligned? And do I still have to take the path that I thought I had to take to get there, right? Is there room for the path to change? And then also, is there room that that goal actually changes? Because for some people, you know, they work on that path and then they realize at some point they stopped caring about the end destination, but they were so focused on getting there that they get there and it's very unfulfilling. Um, or a lot of people, like, for example, they start working for themselves. They build this massive business because they were chasing the revenue numbers. And then when they get there, they're like, wait, I just, I built a business that I hate and I don't want to show up in it. It happens so often. Right. Um, and then alternatively, like using the cottage, the goal for us always was to have a cottage for memories for years with our families. Right. So the path felt like mostly renting it, right? When we first got it, I was like, we're going to barely be here. Like I want to have it fully booked all the time. And then, you know, a bit after it's like, okay, well that we still have that same goal, but now we're going to try to get even more creative of like, okay, is there a way where we could keep this and not do that? Right. It started actually as like, we were waiting on the permit <laughs> to rent it, but I was really enjoying not renting it. And it, it's just constantly like forcing that creative thinking of like, you would think that the creative solution was already renting it so that we could own it at the age that we do. But it's like, okay, there's actually a next step of, can we get more creative? And we've just been bouncing off so many ideas of like how to like expense it in a business, right? Like we could have Josh's clients use it sometimes and give them a weekend, right? Or I'm like, is there a way that, you know, we move here for a year if we want to. So we just started playing with all these different options. And it came down to just like, can we bet on ourselves a little bit more of like, have faith that our main businesses 
could produce enough to support this. And that feels like a really fun, exciting challenge, right? And maybe eventually it won't. And maybe to get to that same goal, it's going to be, okay, let's rent it this year or that year um, and giving that flexibility for it to change. Nice. That's amazing. Okay. So how do people find you, follow you? What's where do we go next? Instagram is definitely my main jam. Um, pretty much everywhere I'm at Mallory Rowan. So MalloryRowan.com, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and now threads <laughs> um, all are an option. MalloryRowan.com slash email will get you on my email list where I send an email every Monday. That's usually like behind the scenes of business or some tips on things like threads. And then MalloryRowan.com slash free workshop will get you a free social media workshop. Ooh, I like it, listeners. How fun was this to be able to meet Mallory, hear about her business adventures, and piece it all together. So thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thank <laughs> you.